Love is an inherent facet of human life. No drama, no film, no book, nothing is ever complete without what they call the love angle. So important is love to human beings that actually human development, a child would not develop well if he was denied love. So this is such an important facet of human being. We should concentrate our attention on it and try to understand something about it. Love is so essential, but on the other hand, we seem to find situations where it's not working. Surely there's no such thing as too much love. You'd think, if you were thinking about it, is it possible to love anyone too much? Love doesn't seem the kind of thing you can have too much about. But on the other hand, there are problems of too much love. So what is this? What is this phenomenon of love? When we think the more love, the better, then what is this concept of too much love? How can both be true? So we must today think about it, find out, research, try and understand what is this love all about. Now let's start with the definition. What is love? Love is universal identification. A person is loving when he can love everybody. When he feels the same for all. Their joys are his joys. Their sorrows are his joys. Whenever there's an identification with our fellow beings, love for everyone. This is called love. How do I know whether I love? When my neighbor buys a Mercedes, I'm as happy as if I had bought it. That's love. His joys are my joys, his sorrows are my joys, are my sorrows. Whenever we have this feeling of oneness, what you feel is what I feel. That's love. So love is a universal benevolence, a universal identification, a feeling common that you have to all people, not all people, to all beings, why only people? The result of such a feeling in us is immense happiness. Feel wonderful. To be a loving person means to be an ever happy person. Nothing in life would bother you. Nothing bothers somebody who has this kind of love in his heart. When other people's faults worry us, they bother us, they agitate us, it only means, I in my heart do not have enough love. Because if I could love this person thoroughly, this person and his faults could never bother me. And a good example of this is a mother and a child relationship. What all a mother has to do for that infant child, she has to clean him up and then he'll throw up and then he cle she cleans up after that. She does so much for him. But she never feels any sense of revulsion. But if she had to do this for anybody else, then she feels a sense of revulsion. Anyone would feel if you have to clean up after anyone else. 
How you feel is and for revulsion. But the mother doesn't feel it for the child. How come? There's so much identification going on over there. So when somebody's faults bother me, when he's done something and I'm revolted, I'm agitated or I'm upset, it's only an indication of the fact that in my heart, I cannot love this person. And so who suffers? I suffer. If I'm not capable of loving, I'm the one suffering. So when I become capable of loving, there is no suffering. There is nothing anyone can do that will bother me. So love is universal oneness when you feel this emotion for everyone. If you do achieve such a state, then nothing anybody can do can ever bother you. No relationship can cause you agitation. No person can cause you trouble. It's not possible. However well said that is, the fact of the matter in life is that relationships do cause us trouble. It does happen that there is strife. Then if love was all this important thing, and if love was going to keep my mind completely calm, completely happy, how come in my relationships I am experiencing any form of agitation? How is this possible? This is where we must carefully understand what is love and what is attachment. It's a crucial difference to make in life. If we don't understand the difference between love and attachment, there is no way a relationship can work. So let us today concentrate our attention on understanding this difference between love and attachment. I repeat, love is universal identification. Attachment is preferential identification. To love some and not others. This is called attachment. But if I love everyone, then that is love. So love is universal identification, an identification of feeling of oneness with everybody. And attachment, on the other hand, is a feeling of oneness with only a few people, with a certain group, with a certain segment, with a few. If I were to ask you, what is the opposite of love? I think you would say, uh, quite rightly so, maybe, the opposite of love is hate. But Vedanta puts it to us that the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is attachment. The opposite of love is attachment. This is, sounds so revolutionary. If this is the first time you are hearing this, it is a shocking statement. The opposite of love is hate. Why attachment? Let us try and understand it. Let us try and understand what is going on. Okay, so love is universal uh, identification and attachment is preferential identification. Some, not all, a certain group, a certain section. So what's so bad in attachment? Examine it. If I love X and not Y, surely there's a reason I'm loving X and not Y? What is the reason I'm loving X? That I'm getting something from X, either physically or emotionally or intellectually, which I'm not getting from Y. The only reason for me to love X more than loving Y is that I'm getting something from X, either physically or emotionally or intellectually, which I'm not getting from Y. So if you think about it, when I say I'm loving X, who am I really loving? If X stops giving me all the things that I want from X, will I continue to love him? Not at all. So when I talk about loving X, who is this person I am loving? You will realize that I'm loving just myself. As long as he caters to me, as long as he does for me, as long as I get physically, emotionally, intellectually, or I hope to get physically, emotionally, intellectually, my love stays. But should this person not cater to me, 
my love and that person will be in the dustbin. I'm not interested anymore. It's an incredible thing, isn't it? The moment I have preferential attachment, all I'm saying is that I love just myself. Because if I were to love without any price tag, why would I ever choose anybody over anybody? Everybody would become equal. Everybody would become same. So the moment I say I love X and not Y, it means that my love is restricted to myself. It really means I don't love anyone. So this is a very crucial difference that we have to make in life. What is the difference between love and attachment? And then what happens when there's attachment? You remember what happens when there's love? I am filled with happiness. The quality of my life improves. Everything seems wonderful. Nobody bothers me. Nothing anyone can do can bother me. Actually, the strings of my life are in my hand. I will choose my happiness. Now, what happens when I'm attached? Just the opposite. I fill myself with agitation. I become very upset with people. I create disharmony in the relationship. And sometimes, unfortunately, I cause damage to this person who I claim to love. There is disharmony generated out of attachment. All quarrels between couples, all quarrels within families, all of this is generated by this simple thing called attachment. Quarrels between countries too, all generated by this thing called attachment. And we better study it carefully and make sure that we don't fall for it. So what happens when we are attached to somebody? When we are attached to somebody, we are equally detached, as it were, from everybody else. So we become very unfair towards everybody else. We may become mean towards everybody else. If there be a teacher who has in her class both her child and <coughs> excuse me, other children, what is that temptation to give her child more marks? The attachment to my child makes me neglect the, my duty towards others. So when I am attached to something or somebody, I create disharmony with all others. Naturally, nobody likes to be second grade, right? So it creates disharmony with others. So when I'm attached to somebody, I create disharmony with others. What else do I do? I create disharmony with the object of my attachment. When we get attached to somebody, we sit on their backs as it were. And that person gets fed up. He doesn't like it. Suppose somebody sat on your back, what would you do? Wouldn't you do? Get off, why are you on my back? Haven't you heard children say that to their parents? Get off my back. All the time, you sit on the person's back. All the time interfering. All the time questioning. All the time wanting. It's too much for that person to take. So they rebel. They react. They want out. Not only that, your attachment is actually causing damage and harm to the person you're attached to. When a mother is very attached to the child, she damages that child. She harms that child. Bitter as this truth may sound, it is true. There was a grandfather who was very attached to his grandchild and the child got diphtheria. And the child was crying, I want ice cream, I want ice cream, I want ice cream. Now when this child was crying, I want ice cream, the grandfather, believe it or not, 
actually went and bought that child ice cream. He couldn't bear to see the child cry. You know what would happen had that child eaten that ice cream. So you can cause a great deal of damage to a person who you are attached to. So when we are attached, we create disharmony with the world, with everybody else around. We also create disharmony with the object of our attachment. You have all these demands, you have all these things you want them to do, you want them to live by your standards. There's questioning, interference, expectations, create disharmony. And that person steps back, they don't want this anymore. They want out. When you notice that the object of attachment is not giving to you as much attention or whatever else you want from that person, this anger starts building up. You would go ahead and harm the object of attachment. Throw acid on the person, kill the person. You would go ahead and harm that person who you claimed to love so much. And all these great tragedies you hear of are this, isn't it? What did Othello do? He claimed to love Desdemona. And Desdemona was supposedly one of the most pure ladies of uh, Shakespearean literature. And yet he suspected her of infidelity. And when he suspected her, he said, put out the light and then put out thy light. And he strangles her and kills her. He loved her. So he would claim, in our language, we call it attachment. When you're so attached to somebody, you will harm the person. Up to the point that you may go ahead and kill the person. All under this guise of this thing called love. So when you're attached to somebody, you create disharmony with the whole world. You create disharmony with that individual. And you have automatically generated disharmony within yourself. There is so much agitation. You go and attach yourself to somebody. We all attach ourselves to somebody. Why? In the hope of happiness. Never recognizing that what you get out of the deal is only agitation. Why would we do it? And yet repeatedly, over and over again, we will go and do this. If one attachment doesn't work, we go to another one. If that one doesn't work, we want to go to another one. One marriage doesn't work, go to another one. That one doesn't work, go to another one. That one doesn't work, go to yet another one. And then you say marriages are useless. Marriages are not useless. There's nothing wrong with marriage. It's how we deal with it. That doesn't mean that you should never take a divorce. Nobody is saying that. You please do whatever you want. But the idea is that if we get attached, that agitation has to start, it has to generate, and it has to wreck our lives. So we must carefully understand this difference between love and attachment. In attachment, there is disharmony with everybody outside. There is disharmony with that person and there is disharmony within oneself. With love, there is harmony with everyone and there is harmony and peace and bliss within. If somebody has disharmony with us, Maybe there's nothing we can do. But why should we have this harmony with them? Why should we hate them? The quality of my life is not determined by how many people hate me. The quality of my life is determined by how many people I love. How much can I love? How much can I take in my stride? There is no human being free of faults. All of us have faults. To say I don't like this person because he has that fault is like saying I don't like anyone including myself. Of course we have faults. Everyone has faults. My virtue is to be able to love in spite of those faults. If I love somebody because he's so good, then that credit is his, isn't it? When I love him even when he's not good, then I can claim the credit is mine. So love is just general harmony. You feel wonderful about everybody. 
and you feel wonderful about yourself. The quality of your life just seems very nice. Just having a good time in anything. So where does love come from? How is it that some people have this capacity to love? Love is not something we can practice. Love is not something that you say, oh, that's good, I must learn to love and I will start loving. It doesn't work like that. Love is an emotion. It's either there or it's not there. You can't say, I'm going to try to love somebody. It doesn't work like that. Then where is love coming from? Love is the natural result of spiritual growth. As you grow spiritually, you just love people. So as we grow up in life, we gain this immense amount of love and affection and a feeling of benevolence towards everybody. We look upon other people's faults as, you know, they are a little childish, they'll grow out of it one day. I was childish at one point, I grew up out of it. These people are a little childish on this issue, they will grow up out, grow up out of it. No big deal. I look upon others from a vantage point as it were. Not a superior position, sympathetic position. If anybody, if anybody has a fault, the poor fellow suffers for that fault. He requires my understanding, my patience, my affection. I'm not helping the situation by criticizing and condemning him. And one of the most glorious expressions of love you can hope to find, a fantastic thing, you know, your hair stand on end to think that a person could actually do this, is this wonderful instance, or actually this terrible instance, of Christ on the cross. Just think about it. Here's a person in whose hands there are nails. He's physically tortured. He's emotionally rejected. He's intellectually abused. He's put up with thieves. Such a person going through probably the nadir of all experiences, the worst of all experiences. And that point when he's going through all that pain, when he's going through that experience, what is he saying? He says, Oh Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. His attention is still on protecting them. He's not saying, You guys, you're doing all this to me. Watch it. Just see what my dad's going to do. You know whose son I am? No such thing. His attention is on protect them, protect them. They don't know what they're doing. That would be our attitude had we grown up like that. We would understand that people are suffering for them for their faults and let me do whatever I can to help. Certainly not condemn them or look down on them. So when my life, when my heart is full of this love and affection for everybody, my whole view of the situation changes. I don't see people's faults as faults. I see them as limitations that maybe one day they will grow out of. While those limitations are there, let me protect them if I can. And of course, I will protect myself. Just as if there's a small child, I don't give a knife in the child's hand. Why? To protect the child and also myself. It would be stupid to do that. So I understand there are these limitations. I take preventive action versus these limitations. But I find nothing to condemn. Nothing to get irritated with. Nothing to get disgusted with. What a wonderful state my mind would be should I ever cultivate this beautiful state of universal affection, of loving everybody. What a state I would reach. When I don't have this, I condemn myself to misery and sorrow. It's my life that I'm wrecking by becoming incapable of love. Maybe nobody else's. 
as I elevate myself, I will learn what this means to just love everybody. No judgments. I just love everybody. Let us hope we all reach this glorious state. Thank you.